Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. As fighting in Ukraine worsens, so does the dire humanitarian situation on the ground. According to the UN Refugee Agency, more than 3 million people had to flee Ukraine over the past three weeks. Around 13 million people more have been affected in war-torn areas within Ukraine and are badly in need of aid. Meanwhile, infectious diseases are likely to spread as the military conflict displaces people and disrupts health services. For instance, COVID infections remain high in the country, and only about 36 percent of Ukrainians are fully vaccinated against COVID. With the country's health services already stretched extremely thin, getting treatment will be increasingly difficult. For more on what's really happening on the ground, I talked to Peter Maurer, the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who arrived in Kiev on March the 16th on a planned five-day visit to call for greater humanitarian access and better protection of civilians. Mr. President, good to see you again. Nice to be with you today. Thank you. You just came back from a five-day trip to Ukraine. What did you see there? Well, I saw uh, increasingly as I was approaching Kiev, uh, the witnesses of a war which has a deep impact on the civilian population. You see all those leaving the countries, you see uh, witnesses and testimony of those displaced in the country. Uh, you see a lot of roadblocks and uh, increasingly also uh, weaponry put in place uh, to shield off uh, any further advancement uh, of troops. You, uh, you see, and I have seen, quite uh, a, a sort of a spooky capital in a lockdown on Wednesday, where there is uh, no people on the street and uh, very few or no restaurants open and only the most important shops open. So you see, indicators of the war and then during the night in particular uh, all the nights i spent uh, in ukraine you hear the testimonies of battlefields close by of uh, rockets and artillery being fired in neighborhoods uh, of sirens going off and which force you to look sh to uh, get into shelter so it's uh, a very strange atmosphere where on the one side life and basic infrastructure may continue in many places including in the capital and on the other hand you see a lot of indicators of a war in the country uh, closer as you approach the capital yeah. there are several things that for example about the humanitarian corridor both sides have been talking about it i mean both sides the ukrainian side and also russian as well uh, do you see that is really in the making it is being maintained or there are a lot of uh, uh should we say disruptions if there were any uh, humanitarian corridor it's obviously difficult to get to agreement but i wanted to highlight that the icrc has accompanied twice now uh, uh long lanes of civilian populations out of Zumi. There was an agreement between the sides, a ceasefire respected. We see smaller ceasefires in smaller cities in the east which hold and which lead to evacuation of people and also to access for humanitarians. And then we do have the situation around Mariupol, which in terms of political, military, strategic interest is more protracted, more difficult, and where trust between the parties is not at the level which allows for concrete agreements which would be so necessary to make such evacuation routes safe and access routes workable. Now, a lot of them are being trapped in Mariupol. What is their condition? Uh, can you describe it? Do you have ICRC workers or do you have local Ukrainian Red Cross workers there? What do they tell you? Well, what we hear from our colleagues inside, who many of them came out last, uh, uh, by the end of last week, uh, is of course that the situation has been catastrophic. We ordered them out of Mariupol also because we can't really work anymore in Mariupol. There is nothing we could 
do distribute fix uh, at the present moment because the shelling and the disruption is massive. Uh, the attacks on infrastructure, the dysfunctioning infrastructure is so massive that we can't really deliver humanitarian services at the present moment in Mariupol. And that's the reason why our team, by and large, uh, the larger part of our team came out. We still hear, as anybody else has, uh, we hear from uh, conditions which are dire by the day, which are extremely difficult. Uh, but I don't see at the present moment any positive dynamics uh, coming to this situation in Mariupol. We see relatively uncoordinated and uh, uh, exits of civilians out of Mariupol, but the situation, of course, uh, inside is extremely difficult. So uh, how do you judge the overall situation in Ukraine? It's not just in certain areas anymore. It's a massive scale of military conflict taking place almost everywhere. Uh, do you see there are still any spots of safety for uh, most of the Ukrainians? Well, there are quite a lot of, uh, I would say, relatively safe spots in a sense that they are not front lines. We all know where the front lines are. They go from Kyiv to the northeast to the south and these are unquestionably uh, a lot of front lines on which people are trapped, people are in need, out of which people are displaced. Uh, it's no question that these are very dangerous places and in Kyiv, uh, in the northern neighborhood of the capital, you see how the sort of front line is organized, how destructive it is, how much shelling is taking place and how much people are impacted uh, by the war uh, close by. Urban warfare uh, in Ukraine is really one of our key concerns at the present moment. A lot of artillery and weaponry is, dis is displayed and used in that highly and densely populated area and that's the reason why we see so much internal displacements and displacements out of Ukraine. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I have also experienced that there is a, an alert system almost. The whole country has sirens uh, with, uh, which alert you when the situation is more dangerous than maybe uh, average. And in that sense, it's also a country which is prepared better than many other contexts in which ICRC is operating. ICRC has been an organization, neutral, independent, and impartial. How, during your trip, you've been talking to both sides, to the Ukrainian side and the Russian side. What level of communication are you trying to conduct during your trip? What are some of the major responses, if you can, you can share with us? Well, this trip was, of course, first and foremost designed to talk to the Ukrainian government uh, and uh, to see some of the realities on the ground. Uh, I will uh, leave for Moscow tomorrow and will have opportunities also to have a, a, a government interlocutors in Moscow. What we try as a humanitarian organization is certainly always to talk uh, first uh, to our peers to the Red Cross uh, organization in Ukraine and in Russia. Secondly, to talk to our line ministry, most of the time the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Prime Ministry. Uh, we certainly want to talk to the militaries, uh, the chief militaries and the ministers of defense on both sides because they are critical to allow and to have a license and offer a license for humanitarian worker. Yeah. There are a lot of practicalities to discuss when you want to assist and protect and ensure respect for the law, uh, but you need to talk to weapons bearers on both sides. What have you talked about in Ukraine? Have you achieved your discussion with all of these different levels of uh, people that you earlier illustrated about? I think we, uh, we have made very good progress in the understanding and in uh, uh, telling the Ukrainian government what we need and the European, Ukrainian government has been very forthcoming uh, to basically offer 
guarantees and facilities to ICRC to increase its assistance or cooperation. Secondly, we have had good and progressing discussions on the critical issues very specific to ICRC's mandate, to the prisoners of war, to those deceased, to the missing people, to family reunifications, to the use of weapons, to the conduct of hostilities. These are issues which uh, intrinsically belong to our role as a guardian uh, for international humanitarian law according to the Geneva Conventions. And this has been a very fruitful, concrete and practical discussions that we could have with the Prime Minister, with the Deputy Prime Minister, with the Minister of Defence in particular. Are we going to see dispatches of uh, returning of uh, prisoners of war, uh, uh, better treatment of prisoners of war, uh, for example, the Russians in Ukraine? Well, we will uh, certainly hope to get notified of all the prisoners, uh, to be able to visit them, to check on their health and treatment. And if the parties uh, subsequently will find agreements to a exchange of prisoners, ICRC is certainly ready and able to facilitate and to organize such exchanges, which are agreed upon by the parties. Mm. Now, you have been <laughs> working with the Ukraine Red Cross uh, for decades. It's a kind of partnership. Uh, tell me more about how, under what kind of circumstances are they operating? What are their main goals uh, right now, uh, both in cooperating with you and also with other Red Cross uh, uh, societies across the world? Well, the Ukrainian Red Cross is, of course, a uh national relief organization which first and foremost at the present moment and in this present crisis is, is focusing to assist those most in need and those most in need are those displaced in the country either internally or towards the border so it's really basic humanitarian services medicine water sanitation services uh, looking uh, to ensure that everybody can shelter where they are, that they have, because they have been disrupted, that they have uh, and are able to continue uh, their lives in, in safety. So we support them in their first aid and first response effort, which is really going through the water, sanitation, health, uh, and basic uh, assistance themes. But then, of course, uh, this is an organization with a couple of thousand volunteers who are also uh, important and great partners of ours to access besieged areas, to help with evacuations from besieged areas. And in that sense, we work very closely together so that the negotiation efforts of ICRC and the very practical delivery efforts of the Ukrainian Red Cross are in sync and as I have mentioned before, if you look at the Zumi and the fact that we brought in together with the Ukrainian Red Cross, we brought out people, we brought in aid and we brought people out is a good indicator of a key role of this national society organization. Mr. President, you've been talking about over the past few days about scaling, speeding up and also adapting. Uh, tell us exactly what you meant briefly. Well, we uh, have doubled our budget. We probably will increase further and we are planning now, compared to our original budget of 75 million Swiss francs, we probably will spend 250 million Swiss francs at least uh, during that year. Uh, that will significantly uh, increase our surface of operation. We will bring people in and specialists in water specialist and sanitation and electricity specialist to fix uh, damaged installations. We will bring in the pipeline of goods where goods are necessary. We will certainly look with the Ukrainian government and also with other authorities to increase our cash contributions to displaced populations. So these are just some of the activities, but we will try to be flexible. You have been also, uh, Mr. President, fight, fighting, shall I say, quote unquote, the several humanitarian wars, not only in Ukraine, but also on the issue of Yemen. Now, there have been comparison about these two issues. 
One is attracting extreme large scale attention, Ukraine. However, Yemen, not really, even though the conflict has been going on for such a long time, including the retreatment of the refugees, including the funding being, being put into it worldwide. So how do you see the differences, uh, Mr. President? What do you have to say about the different hotspot issues and whether people are paying the same amount of attention to all of them? Well, first, it's an issue which is, has been of concern to us for a very long time. And over the last years, I have continuously advocated to close the gap between attention, need, and finance. This is a triangle which uh, is not a happy triangle in many places of the world. Today, I would advocate to take the threshold of response of Ukraine as the measurement to aspire also in other contexts. So we do appreciate that so many donors have uh, interest in supporting our operations and the humanitarian operation in Ukraine. It would be important that we make proactive efforts to draw the attention of donors to the fact that contributions should not be only for Ukraine, but for Ukraine and everybody else suffering around the world. And we hope that donors, traditional and new donors, will give us flexibility to use this money for Ukraine, for what is intended at the present moment, but also to have it used uh, maybe in other contexts where need are, as you rightly say, as important as in Ukraine. China has uh, on Monday announced of 10 million yuan additional aid to Ukraine. Is this going to be done through direct interaction with Ukraine? What is going to be the ICRC's role in terms of working with many different individual countries? Well, at the present moment, we work first and foremost with those countries channeling humanitarian assistance through the ICRC. As you know, there are multiple channels. And on the ground, we will certainly do best efforts to coordinate well with those who are there and bring important contributions, first and foremost, that across societies of so many countries in the world, whom I have seen on the ground already at the borders of Poland, Hungary and Romania, and we will continue to do so in the future. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks a lot.